uh, sometimes people who know the Quran and um, particularly those who are sort of familiar with the idea that um, the prophets in the Quran are impeccable, sinless, um, they might then read stories that appear about figures with the same names, say Noah and Lot, maybe David, in the Bible. And uh, in some of these stories, uh, these characters seem to be behaving badly. So, yeah, could you sort of um, speak to this whole issue? Uh, why is it that characters like Noah and Lot, whom Muslims may know as prophets, impeccable prophets, uh, do these peculiar things in the Bible? Sure. First of all, thank you for having me. Um, I appreciate it. Um, so uh, two things, I guess, are important to recognize uh, in addressing that question. One is that obviously it's not Muslims of the 20th, 21st century alone who have noticed these issues, that this, the difference between the behavior of these shared prophets um, in the Bible and in the Quran were noticed in the medieval era. And it was part of the polemics, um, sort of the Christian Jewish, uh, the Muslim Jewish polemics in the medieval right. period, sort of showing the, um, the primacy or the victory of the Quran, sort of the Quran as a better version of the revelation and the Bible is sort of a messed up version of the revelation. But um, what it's important to realize is that the Bible does not intend for the, the people who are behaving badly in the Bible are recognized as behaving badly in the Bible. In other That's words, a really the, good point. Yeah. That, that the Quran has a, has an understanding that, that all these characters are prophets and that therefore the expectation is that they should behave in a prophetic fashion, sort of as a person who is worthy of, of conversation with God. Um, but not all of these people who whom the Quran labels prophets are actually labeled as prophets in the Bible. So they're and, not always uh, examples to be imitated or exemplary. No, sometimes they're in fact examples to be to, to do the opposite. Right. right. So, so they do X and then the story is don't do that. And that that person becomes... Um, an example of of proper behavior in the Quran, but he, he didn't start that way. In not start that way, I shouldn't say it that way. But he he didn't appear that way in the in the biblical um, in the biblical materials. Um, and so right, so so the person is not a prophet and is not a model of exemplary behavior. It's just a character. And the definition of what a, of what prophecy means or what a prophet means in the Islamic system and in the biblical system is different. So just because someone talks to God or God talks to them, doesn't give them the designation of prophet in the biblical worldview. So you have people that God talks to, um, for instance, in the rabbinic understanding, the forefathers aren't prophets. They're not called prophets the way that the Quran would call Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Ishmael, that would call them prophets. And even though they all talk to God and God talks to them in the Bible, and in a sense, they have the spirit of prophecy, they're not part of that class of people that we would right. call right. prophets mm -hmm. in the in the uh, rabbinic system and in the sort of the rabbinic understanding of the biblical worldview so um and there is no sense of of the isma of the prophets sort of this infallibility even the people who are prophets in the bible don't have infallibility which is a completely different understanding of what a prophet should behave like Right, right. Okay, so uh, what is it that makes prophets prophets in the Bible? I mean, the class because you mentioned like you know yeah. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the as you mentioned forefathers or patriarchs. We don't think uh, the Bible doesn't present them principally or at all as prophets. So, what is a prophet in the Bible? It, it looks like the pro the people who are who are um, classically presented as prophets. I mean, the Bible doesn't talk about sort of a class of people. I think it's us as readers that give them the designation or the, or the rabbinic readers give them the designation of a class of prophets. It seems to be people who come with a mission. And so in that sense, it is equivalent to um, to sort of pr to prophets in the Quran that they are, they're leaders of the community. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob aren't primarily leaders of communities, right? They're the, they're the forefathers sort of start sure. the whole- On their own. <laughs> yeah, they like set it in motion, but there's not really a community that they're leadership of. So in that sense, Moses is is really a prophet. He has a community that he's that he's in charge of and he's leading, and they use their um, relationship with God or their communication with God as as part of their being the leader, right? So like they're they're God chooses them for that job, and that it's it's their relationship with God that gives them that 
authority and that sense of guidance. So most of the people in the Hebrew Bible section of the book called prophets, that's where you would find like the class of prophets. But but um, just to, can I step back just to clarify? I mean, our, our viewers may or may not know that the Hebrew Bible, I think, is traditionally uh, uh, understood by Jews as consisting of the Torah, the prophets and the writings. So, that's yeah. Okay. Yeah, so the 27 books of the Hebrew Bible are divided into three sections. And the um, just to explain very briefly, the, the first part goes, the Bible, unlike the Quran, as you know, well know, is um, written in chronological order, right, where the Quran does, is not in mm -hmm. chronological order. Mm -hmm. um, so it starts with the creation of the world, and it, it ends, that first section, the Torah ends more or less with the death of Moses, as the Israelites are on the border with the land of Israel to conquer it. And then the next section, which is called the uh, the prophets section, starts with the conquering, and then goes basically almost to the end of the chronological status of the Bible. Um, but the not everybody in the books of prophets are prophets. So there's like a whole um, a whole segment that's actually called Judges, where right the the biblical book is called the Book of Judges not the book of prophets, even though the judges are themselves frequently in communication with God. So those judges are also prophets, but the designation that they are given is called judges. So mm -hmm. the designation of what's a prophet is differs in the Hebrew biblical, in the Hebrew Bible perception, and in the rabbinic readers after that, so in the Jewish community after that. So again, Moses is a prophet, um, Isaiah, Ezekiel, um, I, you know, in the Quran, Aaron is a prophet and he does talk to God in the Hebrew Bible, but he's not classically considered to be a prophet. That's not his main job. His main job is that he's the high priest. So, so does this mean, uh, I mean, does this mean that basically the difference is that in the Quran, prophets are central. The role is sort of foundational for the relationship between God and humanity. And in the Bible, not so much. It's just one of a bunch of vocations and... It's not that big of a deal. Uh, not that big of a deal. I don't think that it would. Okay. okay. <laughs> um, that it would. That would be a, a sort of an accurate selling way. short. Selling short. Yeah. Yeah. Um, is it found more foundational to the Quran than it is in the Bible? I mean, the conversation and the relationship with God is very foundational in the Hebrew Bible. I just think that the. I feel like in the Quran you get this job description, of. Mm -hmm prophet that is applied to more people and that doesn't necessarily have with it um an idea about leading up a people right i mean i think even in the quran abraham doesn't lead a people yep right so, right. so but he's still considered a prophet right um yeah so it seems like we're just dealing with different sort of religious systems or yeah um, i mean each with its own coherence but um it's it's good to recognize like this is kind of like one system or world over here. This is another one. Can, right. Going back to that initial bit, I mean, so does it solve? Does that solve the problem that uh, Noah and Lot, for example, um, probably David, but you can correct me in the Bible, they're not prophets, so their 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 role is not to act well. Uh, maybe yeah. with David, it's a little more complicated. But at least Noah and Lot, I mean, the role is not really to act well. Um, their role is to for the Bible to tell stories about them that redound to some sort of lesson, whether or not it's someone acting well or someone acting poorly. Does that make sense? Or? So Noah and Lot are, I think, two different cases, actually, okay. Okay. Um, because Noah in the Hebrew Bible is called righteous. Right. And so then you would expect him to behave better. Good point. Yes. Than somebody who's not called righteous. And yes. Lot Lot is never called righteous. He's sort of, the assumption is that he's righteous by association because he's Abraham's nephew. Mm -hmm. And the Hebrew Bible has them traveling together at the very beginning that that they are together. And when Abraham follows God's word to move from, um, from the Ur of the Chaldees into the land of Canaan, he takes Lot with him, right? That right. Lot is part of his traveling. So, so you assume that he's gotten a good education on how to be a righteous person from Abraham. Along the way, then, I mean, it's a long, it's a long journey. Yeah. So and, must have been talking about he, something. Right, exactly. Yeah, they they must he must have spoken to his nephew. Um yes. but yeah, but Noah, you expect him to be righteous. Mm -hmm. Um and uh because he is 
that's the whole reason his whole raison yes. d'etre right is that yes. he's righteous and he's his righteousness saves him from destruction mm -hmm. and then you see him do things that some obviously problematic and some less obviously problematic okay so, so the it, obvious one is getting getting drunk at the end i guess right and yeah so you know it's not getting drunk at the end isn't the problem right because being drunk is not a problem in the hebrew bible it's not okay you can be drunk and okay. there's no problem with drinking wine okay the, the problem is not so much lots as his son who sees him naked or Noah. Uh, you said lots but you meant Noah. i'm sorry i meant Noah. yes i'm sorry back to lot is it what you asked about no no we're, we're talking about noah totally oh, okay and so the your problem you're saying is is uh is ham or canaan right. maybe i don't know if we want to get into the weeds of this question right it's so complicated but the problem okay so the problem is more ham uh walking into noah's and seeing right. him naked or right i mean the bible doesn't portray noah necessarily sort of very obviously as doing something wrong then okay. the okay. the exegesis comes in and says like this was what he did he just got saved from from devastation and the first thing that he oh. does is plants a vineyard and get but then when you think about that it's not the first thing it takes years to plant a vineyard right right and right. then turn it into wine so so we sort of have this this criticism of him that it's the first thing he did but when you think about sort of time frame it's probably not so first the first thing he does actually is sacrifice to god right mm -hmm. a, a sacrifice of thanks nonetheless it does seem that rolling around naked in your tent that drunk not maybe the best use of your time as a righteous person although... there's a really awkward scene have you seen the movie noah like 15 years old maybe uh yeah. which is sort of premised on there's the ecological like oh, yeah. humanity is bad because they're ruining the ecology and noah has compassion for animals and plants this kind of like do you know this movie it, vaguely yeah but anyway the scene at the end of the vineyard the vineyard nakedness scene is it's just awkward to watch oh yeah yeah, yeah. it's it's a strange, it's a strange thing. I mean, I think Noah's um, less obvious shortcoming is that he gets word that the world is going to be destroyed and he doesn't say anything about it to anybody. Right. So I think that's his, and I say less obvious because the text doesn't say you're doing something wrong, Noah, it calls him righteous and then he's quiet, but the rabbinic readers actually notice it um and comment on it and it becomes particularly obvious when you compare the noah story with the jonah story which is a very similar situation 